the uh, French neuroscientist Benjamin Libet did certain experiments in the 1980s, which other neuroscientists um, generalized to show, uh, which, which they suggested showed that never do our intentions, our purposes, make any difference to w what we do. What we do is controlled just by brain goings on, and we think we have formed an intention, and that's why uh, we do something, but really it's, it's just brain goings on that make uh, this difference. And the evidence which was uh, brought forth for that by, uh, at any rate, the followers of Libet was that they found that whenever somebody does uh, an intentional action, uh, decides to move their hand or decides to go for lunch or something, there is always some build-up of electrical potential on their skull which Im uh, uh, indicates some brain going on. And uh, many neuroscientists, and uh, that happens before uh, the subject forms any intention to go to lunch or any intention to wave their hand. And so many neuroscientists said, oh, well, what that shows is that the brain event causes the motion of the hand and the intention has nothing to do with it. But of course, all that the experiment showed is that uh, equally compatible with the experimental results w would have been that the original brain event causes the intention and the intention itself causes the motion of the hand. Uh, well, um, uh, neuroscientists could try and do some more complicated experiment uh, which might show that uh, the motion of our hands was simply caused by bodily goings on. But I don't think they could ever show that the intentions, our intentions don't cause that. Though in some few cases they might uh, show that we are uh, for, uh, compelled by bodily uh, going, brain goings on to form an intention, but uh, I see no reason to suppose that to be generally the case because all that neuroscience throws up is information about the inclinations, the desires to which we are subject, and we all know that when faced with a choice with acting on some desire or yielding to temptation, it's up to us what we do, and um, uh, nothing that neuroscience has shown has any inclination to show that it isn't in those cases. So on this view, um, dualism actually uh, helps preserve uh, free will uh, in a way that uh, otherwise uh, free will might be uh, brought into question. Yes. Um, I don't think dualism is necessary for holding a doctrine of free will, but it certainly uh, <laughs> helps to accent to bring out what is involved in it that is to say that what determines us a our, our actions is uh, what we we determine our action and we determine our action in the light of reasons and desires to which we are subject and uh, intuitively we know or think we know that's how how, how things happen and nothing that uh, any neuroscientist has produced uh, uh, shows that it isn't. And Tim, I know you've been concerned to uh, defend uh, a version of free will as well. Do you think that your emergent view uh, uh, helps with the free will question vis-a-vis uh, -vis substance dualism? Uh, I, I believe it's as compatible as substance dualism is with the view that we, we exercise a, a limited measure of autonomy. We are not perfectly free beings. We, we're constrained. Um, as uh, science shows, not just neuroscience, but shows through psychology, we're often subject to unconscious influences. So it's a constrained freedom of will, but I think we do have sufficient freedom that we can be held morally accountable for our choices. Um, we, we, it's a commonplace that the popular press often does a very poor job of reporting scientific findings, and uh, I agree with Richard that in some cases the scientists themselves are a source of the problem in so far as they put philosophical glosses on their findings that go well beyond their, their, their findings. They're putting an interpretation on their findings um, that uh, the, the, the results themselves uh, hardly um, uh, imply. Um, although they, they might be compatible with the findings. And so um, I, I agree with Richard that it's often overblown so, um, some, of the, some of the interesting things that are 
being learned um, about uh, how the brain functions. Um, but uh, it's, we should recognize that uh, the science of the brain is still in relative infancy, or maybe in its adolescence, you might say, at this point. Um, uh, before the 1950s, very little was known about the details of brain function. Um, and now scientists seem to have a very good handle on how individual cells of the brain, neurons interacts, interact, um, transmitting chemicals across synapses and, and that sort of thing. But how large scale um, assemblies of neurons produce uh, or involved in the production of complicated bodily behavior, and as, let alone conscious choices, is still not well understood at all. There is a differentiation of function. Um, scientists have been able to identify different regions of the brain being associated with different functions like the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and so forth. But uh, most of the, of the really crucial details about how um, uh, complex behavior is produced are, 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 are still wide open. Um, and uh, I agree that the, the, the Libet findings just show that there's activity, um, uh, a, a kind of um, preparatory activity perhaps, uh, where we know we're about to, uh, you know, you have to think about the limit sort of scenario where, where you're, you're being invited to, um, to, to engage in a specific behavior, such as wiggling your finger, within a short interval of time, and then you're just asked to spontaneously. Um, uh, decide when you will engage in that behavior, and that there should be some sort of anticipatory um, brain activity to enable a smooth uh, carrying out of that behavior when, when a choice is made is, is not terribly surprising, right? We don't, uh, on no sensible view, whether it's su a substance dualist view or, or my sort of view or even on a materialist view, on no view do uh, choices just come out of the blue, uh, quite apart from any antecedent influences. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I think I think I, I do want to have a view on which we have a we have capacities to make choices that don't reduce to physical capacities, and that we we consciously control that capacity, um, uh, at least in many circumstances, uh, when we're fully in control of our faculties and we're we're aware of uh, real options available to us. And I think that's wholly consistent with the findings of neuroscience. Yes, all that the neuroscientists have discovered in more detail about the goings on in the brain before we make uh, decisions uh, only allow, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they may have established a correlation between certain goings on and say the subject moving their hand, but the correlation is not 100%, it's 80% or 75%, that is to say, and that indicates that what they've discovered is an inclination to do it, to which eventually the subject may or may not decide to follow. But one point about neuroscience, I wouldn't altogether agree with you, about individual neurons. Sure, uh, what is known is that um, <laughs> the brain is a large collection of neurons and each neuron transmits uh, an electrochemical influence to the next neuron. But how, how it, it does this by releasing a small amount of transmitter substance which uh, clings to the next neuron and starts, starts uh, an, an electrical pulse passing through that. But whether it does this or not just depends on just how much transmitter substance is released and just how wide the gap between the two neurons, the synaptic cleft, is and just what happens to each bit of transmitter substance that's released. And the, these are goings on on a very, very small scale. And such literature as I have read imply, uh, is certainly favorable to the view that these goings on, uh, whether enough uh, neuro, whether enough transmitter substance is released at the cleft in order to start an impulse uh, passing through the next neuron, uh, depends on such small differences that these differences lie within the quantum limit. That is to say, um, the great uh, physical theory of the 20th century, quantum theory, uh, is an indeterministic theory. Uh, it says that on the small, smallest of small scales, uh, you can only talk about probabilities of things happening, not about uh, inevitabilities of things happening. And 
the scales involved in the transmission of um, electric charge from one neuron to another are on that very small scale so that whether the uh, potential is transmitted does depend on something within the quantum limit and is therefore not uh, predetermined. Of course it is logically possible that these <laughs> that uh, 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 s these very small differences uh, in one neuron isn't going to make a very great difference to our large-scale behavior. On the other hand, it may make a very large-scale difference to our behavior. That isn't known, but there is a undoubtedly a certain amount of indeterminism in the brain, so it would be perfectly compatible with all we know uh, about um, uh, the operation of the brain to suppose that some of its operation is not determined by physical laws.